Hello everyone. Uh, so we are back with the seventh talk from the Science Club, organized jointly with the Campus Radio team. So uh, our for our today's speaker, uh, we have uh, Mr. Arvind Ravi, uh, who is an alumni of either Kolkata, 12 MS batch, who is currently doing his PhD in physics at University of Texas at Arlington. He is mainly interested in high energy astrophysics, with his research focusing on X-ray observations of young supernova remnants. Since 2018, uh, he has been working on X-ray observations of the supernova 1987A using NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. So we look forward to having an interesting talk ahead. Uh, handing over to Mr. Arvind for the talk. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yeah, it's visible. Okay, so uh, thank you to the organizers, both Science Club and the Campus Radio at Isaac Kolkata for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to <clears throat> uh, undergraduates at uh, undergraduates and graduates at Isaac Kolkata. And uh, today I would like to talk about supernovae and supernova remnants in general, and also talk to you uh, about the curious case of supernova 1987A. Uh, I'd like to uh, give out a basic understanding of supernova, supernova remnants, because uh, this talk is uh, aimed at uh, giving an overview of uh, what these things mean. And uh, finally, I would touch upon some parts of my research. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Physics at University of Texas at uh, Arlington. So to give some background, I am an alumni of Isar Kolkata, as Bipradeep just said, uh, from 12MS batch. And I completed my MS thesis in physical sciences under our own Professor Narayan Banerjee uh, in 2017. I was also fortunate to take part in some of the astronomy summer projects as an undergraduate at uh, CPS Mumbai, ICTS Bangalore, and uh, AEI Hanover throughout my five years. So to give an outline of what the talk today is going to be about, uh, I would first like to talk a bit about uh, what astronomy research is, um, introduce what supernovae are, uh, talk about what they leave behind, which are called supernova remnants, and finally uh, touch upon supernova 1987A, which is a very unique supernova and why we study it and some basic results from um, my own research. And uh, I, I, I wanted to say this out front that uh, this talk is uh, mostly focused on uh, giving out basic information about supernova and supernova remnants. And if there are some slides towards the end which are a bit technical or have some jargon, I just wanted to set the stage up for explaining those things later on. So if we look at the Astro PH, which is the archive page or the preprint page for most of the astrophysics research that we see on a daily basis, we can see that there are several different avenues one can perform uh, research uh, for astronomy at, uh, uh, at different length scales from uh, solar to stellar astrophysics and the astrophysics of galaxies, dark matter, dark energy, et cetera. But basically, you can boil down all of these avenues of research into three main categories. Uh, the first one is observational astronomy, uh, which uh, spans almost the entire electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays. And uh, the recent addition of gravitational waves have uh, uh, started have uh, uh, started the multi-wavelength astronomy, uh, multi-messenger astronomy, rather, uh, 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 research in, in our fields. The other avenue is the theoretical aspects of research, where we look at certain observations and try to see how, how best one can describe them using mathematical equations. So here I have presented a very simple hydrostatic equilibrium equation, where each of those parameters means something physically. So these equations describe the data perfectly, and uh, they they go in they go hand in hand and help one another. As you know, astronomy is a very uh, telescope dependent science. So that means that there needs to be a specific field which includes astronomers who are experts on instrumentation and who have the vision 
to uh, come up with instruments that are extremely important for new generation observations and uh, theoretical explorations. So some of the uh, four of the great observatories, I, I show here four of the great observatories from NASA, uh, the Compton uh, Gamma Ray Telescope, Spitzer Infrared Telescope, Chandra X-ray Telescope, and the Hubble uh, Visible and Ultraviolet Telescope. So if I ask uh, a random stranger, or, or, or someone who is new to science, usually their answer about, when I ask them what astronomy is and what astrophysics is, usually the answer is that astronomy is the observational aspect of uh, studying uh, celestial objects, and astrophysics is the theoretical aspect of uh, studying those objects. And uh, I just wanted to clear this myth that this is completely wrong. Uh, in modern day science, astronomy and astrophysics are just the same word used in a different way. Uh, and uh, it doesn't make any sense to say that uh, astronomy is just purely observations without having to use any physics because uh, modern astronomy or astrophysics cannot be done without, uh, with, uh, with the combination uh, or synergy between observations and theory. Uh, before I... Uh, start with the science aspects of the talk i just wanted to talk about the astronomy research that happens at qta which is the which is my university uh, we have uh, three astronomy faculty members and uh, we have a mix between observational astronomy uh, dr sangup park is my advisor and uh, he works on supernova remnants, neutron stars, interstellar medium, and galactic center, while uh, Dr. Gislav Muslak and Dr. Manfred Kunz are on the theory side of astronomy. They work on exoplanets, and also uh, Professor Muslak works on the origin of dark matter and dark energy through uh, fundamental equations of physics. So let's start with what uh, supernovae are. Uh, consider uh, a huge mass of uh, gas and dust called the stellar nebulae. These are like the stellar nurseries or where stars are born. So what kind of evolution a star takes is, is entirely dependent on its initial mass. So for a simplistic understanding, uh, most of the uh, evolution can be divided into two different categories. Uh, the uh, a sun-like star or a main sequence star and uh, a, a massive star. So the stellar nebula, can, uh, can um, uh, form a sun-like star, which has a mass from 0 0.3 to about uh, six or seven solar masses, or a massive star, which is more massive than eight solar masses. So let's, uh, because we have two different avenues, let's discuss each of these avenues individually. So a sun-like star is powered by fusion of hydrogen into helium. And over several billion years of such nuclear fusion, this hydrogen is depleted. And as the hydrogen depletes, the core shrinks. And when, when the core shrinks, the temperature inside increases, which in turn increases the rate of the remaining hydrogen that is left uh, for nuclear fusion. So this is sort of a, a, a feedback which causes more and more hydrogen to rapidly burn out. However, the, so this increased rate uh, pressure pushes the outer layers because you have decreased a uh, nuclear fusion. And as you know from uh, hydrostatic, hydrostatic equilibrium, that uh, a star exists in its equilibrium phase because there is nuclear fusion supporting uh, the mass of the star. So this increased rate pushes the outer layers away, forming something called as a red giant. So the red giant has roughly the size uh, about 200 times or 256 times the radius of our own sun. So our sun in several billion years forms a red giant. And by this time, our Earth would all uh, Earth would be completely engulfed by sun and there won't be any life left on Earth at this time. On the other hand, for a massive star, we have way more gravity acting on them. That means it's much hotter and the fusion is much faster. So that means they, they, they go through or uh, use up their fuel much faster than a, a small sun-like star because they have much more mass and much higher temperatures. So with the, with the higher rate of hydrogen to helium conversion, they are much hotter. And this ensures that the fusion continues on to heavier elements, while the outer layers are continuously pushed outside uh, by the same uh, physical principles. But now it's pushed out much further because of the uh, increase in the uh, initial mass. 
So they form something called as the red supergiant, and these red supergiants are about 1500 times the radius of the sun. Uh, in fact, uh, you could actually spot a red supergiant with your naked eye. So if you go out to the, uh, if you go out at night in the northern hemisphere, you can see the, uh, you can see the, uh, the Orion constellation, and the shoulder of the Orion constellation is a star called Betelgeuse, which is in its red supergiant phase, and uh, uh, we do we we uh, don't know when it will go supernova, but uh, there is a high chance that it goes supernova in the next few million years, which in astronomical terms is right uh, right by our doorsteps. So once again, because we have a red giant and a red supergiant, let's talk about how they evolve uh, separately. Uh, for a red giant. Uh, as eventually all the hydrogen is depleted because when 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 your uh, uh, star is in uh, equilibrium with hydrogen burning it's in the main sequence and it moves on to the red giant branch as the hydrogen is depleted and the helium burning begins and this results in the eventual formation of carbon oxygen so as you know you can have uh, the, the the atomic number keeps increasing as the fusion increases and uh, you form carbon and oxygen uh, once again, it's the same physical process where the core shrinks and the electron temperature increases and the uh, outer stellar rays are now pushed further because of increased radioactive uh, uh, pressure from the center. Uh, and this, this is pushed out into the ambient medium and it forms a planetary nebula, which spatially distributes the uh, stellar matter. However, by this point for a main sequence, uh, for, for a star that started as a main sequence star, there is not enough radiation pressure to support the shrinking core. And uh, it eventually, the, the stellar, matter st stellar matter is spread out into the ambient medium while the core shrinks down into a white dwarf, which is supported purely by electron degeneracy pressure. And this happens in, uh, 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 in a time span of about thousands of years. If such a white dwarf uh, is found in a binary system, either with a, a red giant, is a red giant, or uh, another white dwarf, then uh, we can have a thermonuclear explosion. So, in case um, we can, so there are two two cases to consider. Our present day observations do not discriminate, or do not we do not have an understanding of which one is a better explanation of su such an explosion. But uh, uh, the the single degenerate case is considered to be when a white dwarf uh, orbits around a red supergiant, and because it is much more dense, it starts accreting matter from this red giant. And as more and more mass is accreted by this white dwarf, and when it exceeds the Chandrasekhar mass limit, which is the one, which is 1.4 solar masses, uh, a, a, a thermonuclear explosion happens, which is called as the Type 1A supernova. And the other way to achieve the same uh, result is when we have two white dwarfs that are uh, orbiting around each other. They, uh, uh, their orbits decay, and finally they merge onto one another, increasing the mass beyond the Chandrasekhar limit once again going through a thermonuclear explosion called as type 1a supernova and these supernova are some of the most energetic uh, explosions in the universe and they are only surpassed by some other forms of supernova that i uh, would talk about uh, slightly later so a unique aspect of uh, these type 1a supernova uh, is that uh, if we consider the uh, light curves of these supernovae they are called type 1a supernovae from different galaxies a light curve is just how much flux you observe uh, as a function of time. So basically, you look at the supernova at day zero, you look at the supernova at day 20, 40, and see how much flux you observe. And this is uh, a, a very complicated way to just uh, basically say luminosity or flux. So this is just flux. Uh, and what is surprising about these light curves is that they can all be corrected by a stretching factor. So all of these individual light curves are from different galaxies. So if you look at just the raw light curve, they are all they are all sort of aligned. And you can see that if, if we scale each of them, uh, you can align each of those uh, light curves, each of the individual light curve having their own stretch factors. 
Now, because and and what we find is that they all have the same peak luminosity once they once they are connected by this stretching factor. So as they have standard luminosities, they can be used as what we call as standard candles of luminosity at different distances across our universe. So that means. This is a better way to estimate distances uh, to these galaxies, which are much, much, uh, which, which have very, very high uh, redshifts. So this incredible result was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2011, where using this uh, technique, they found out that the universe is not just expanding as Hubble thought, but is undergoing an accelerated expansion. So type 1a supernova are extremely important and we, we continue to uh, increase our pool of type 1a supernova across the entire observable universe. Now going back to the red supergiant. So the red supergiant is uh, so massive and it has so high temperatures that it can burn through most of the products of the nucleosynthesis. This means that the, the fusion extends uh, not just till oxygen or carbon, it extends all the way till iron. So hydrogen fuses into helium, helium fuses into carbon, carbon fuses into oxygen, oxygen to silicon, and silicon to iron. This is a very prototypical example of a, of a, a, a massive star. And if we were to look at uh, the, the interiors of a massive star, we will see these onion-like uh, uh, rings with each of those rings stratified with different chemical elements. And the duration for each of these phase is uh, it decreases with time because as the core shrinks, it uh, it is much it is hotter and hotter and when 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 the core is hot, the rate of uh, radioactivity is much uh, higher and thus the duration for uh, depletion of these uh, chemical elements is much lower. However, iron, uh, as you might know, has the highest binding energy, so there won't be any further spontaneous uh, fusion and. And now, just imagine there's this huge chunk of mass, like uh, 25, in this example, we have 25 solar masses. So 25 solar masses are, is now supported by nothing. There's no fusion. Uh, there's just uh, a dead core, and it's not, it's not uh, supporting this mass. So what happens is a rapid core collapse. Uh, with such a, a core collapse, the temperature shoots up as protons and electrons start merging. And this releases uh, a, an incredibly large amount of neutrinos. And the infalling layers, so all of this mass starts uh, uh, falling towards the core because, because of gravity. And uh, they bounce back from, from, from the core. So the, so the implosion basically converts into an explosion. Uh, we do not know uh, exactly the process of why this happens. But our best understanding today is that neutrinos, because they are so highly energetic in clumps, can drive such, such an explosion. So this is called a core collapse supernova explosion. And what is left behind is a neutron star or black hole at the center based on the initial mass of the red supergiant. So if, if, uh, if a core collapse happens then and neutrinos are formed, then we know that a neutron star was formed. But if more mass falls out of the neutron star, then the neutron star will collapse to the uh, will collapse to a black hole. But as you know, black holes don't radiate in the electromagnetic spectrum so it's more difficult to uh, to to detect a black hole uh, however neutron stars can be pulsating neutron stars or non pulsating central compact objects and they can be detected through imaging and spectroscopic analysis so now we talked about supernovae so each of these supernovae types have leave behind something that we call as supernova remnants. So shocks from these supernova explosions heat up the ambient medium. And uh, you, this is an example of uh, a supernova remnant that was formed from a type 1a supernova, which is a thermonuclear explosion. And uh, this uh, is, uh, and this is, uh, th this was discovered by Kepler in 1604. And this is an example uh, uh, supernova remnant from a core collapse uh, explosion. It's called Cassiopeia A. And while we do not have a historical record of when it was detected, I mean, when it was observed, uh, we have rough age estimates of around 300 years. So these are incredibly extended and large objects uh, to give you a sense of the distances uh, from one end till the, uh, till the other. Uh, this object is about 49 light years. So if, if light tra starts traveling from this end to the other end, it takes 49 years to, uh, to cover this entire object. And uh, Cassiopeia is about 29 light years. 
So what you can see uh, uh, is that these uh, the, the ambient medium, which existed before the explosion, uh, could be made up of uh, circumstellar matter. Circumstellar matter means the uh, material from the star, which the star lost due to various reasons, one of the primary reasons being stellar wind, or interstellar matter, which is just the matter between two stars, uh, usually made up of hydrogen. And uh, the shocks heat up this medium and create these wonderful structures that can be studied for hundreds and thousands of years. So heavy elements, uh, in case of a core collapse supernova, heavy elements from the bowels of the stars uh, that are ejected out in the explosion are called the stellar ejector. So we, we call them the stellar ejector. And uh, as you saw in the onion-like structure, there's, uh, there's iron, silicon, oxygen, and several other elements. So these, these get thrown out from the center uh, to the ambient medium. And this is uh, very important because this is how exactly almost all of our universe gets its metals from. So we focus on, uh, because I want to motivate uh, towards supernova 1987A, which is a core collapse supernova, I would like to focus more on core collapse supernova and, and, and their remnants from now on. To just give you an anatomy, a general anatomy of a core collapse supernova remnant, uh, we have basically three uh, main uh, shock structures. And uh, as the uh, uh, as the explosion happens, as a core collapse explosion happens, a highly supersonic shock wave is created as the expanding ejecta, which I said is from the center of these uh, uh, these uh, massive stars, and they run into the interstellar medium, which is just the matter between two stars. And this shock propagates outwards, heating up the ambient circumstellar or uh, interstellar medium. So behind this blast wave, which is moving outside, uh, the the uh, shocked ISM is compressed more and more. So because the because there is a layer of compression between the shocked ISM and the shocked ejector, now we have two different surfaces of different densities, and the separating surface is called as a contact discontinuity. Uh, just like how the forward shock is formed at the uh, at the outside edge of these uh, these. Uh, uh, compressed interstellar gas columns on the inside edge we also for a, a, a canonical double shock structure is formed uh, which is called as a river shock that moves towards the center of the uh, uh, of the supernova remnant eventually heating up the neutron star at the center and it's showing up in different wavelengths for us to detect so the uh, the contact discontinuity basically separates the forward and reverse shock regions. So the general takeaway from this particular slide, which is a bit dense, is that we have three different kinds of uh, surfaces. We have the sh forward shock front, we have the reverse shock front, and we have the contact discontinuity. So what are the pros of why do we need to study or why should we study supernova remnants? Uh, as everything everything in life there are pros and cons of studying supernova remnants uh, they are probes of their progenitor star so because stars are not as luminous as supernova explosions or supernova remnants it's difficult to study them as they exist as they go through their life uh, far away stars but supernova remnants can probe their progenitor star basically probe into the past of these stars and the medium into which they explode enriching them with metals so all the metals that we see around us were formed in some star or the other and uh, uh, one might ask why study supernova remnants and not just supernovae directly so the reason is that supernovae while they are common we detect like 100 supernovae per year they are all so far away that they fade off within days or months of their discovery and uh, uh, for a large milky way for a large spiral galaxy like our own uh, the the average rate average rate of supernovae explosions is like one or two per century but because there's so much dust at the center of our galaxy a lot of these supernovae are obscured and we can't observe them so however on the other hand supernova remnants while they are uh, less frequent Whenever they happen, they they stay for tens of thousands of years, so we can have a con we can have continuous exploration and study of uh, what they do to their ambient medium and study about the past of the their progenitor stars. They are cosmically accelerators because these shocks accelerate particles all around, and 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 they create these cosmic rays that we that uh, that reach even the Earth. 
And also, they are the birthplaces of neutron stars and stellar black holes, which, as we know, are some of the most interesting and important astrophysical objects. So if you want to study about how neutron stars are formed, how they cool, or how stellar mass black holes are formed, we need to study supernova remnants. And they also quite well constrain explosion models. Now onto the cons, which are very similar to the pro uh, pros. So if a certain condition is not met, the pro becomes a con. So if the distances are, and ages are unknown, then we can't estimate any kinematics. Uh, once again, if uh, because most of the supernova remnants that we study are in our galaxy, and if they are obscured or if we do not, uh, we can't estimate the distances within our galaxy, uh, uh, we can't really uh, carry out kinematics or shock kinematics or see how fast things are uh, expanding or uh, being heated up. Uh, once again, supernova remnants are extremely rare. so it's at a disadvantage because the total number of observations is much smaller than what we have when we compare with supernovae. Uh, if, if the progenitor is unknown, then we can't constrain explosion models. If, if we don't know from beforehand which star exploded, then we can't constrain how it exploded. Uh, if the uh, if the environment in which it explodes is unknown, once again, if we don't have any other observations of that environment, we can't distinguish between what came from the star, what was already there, and what was ejected from the center of the star. Also, by the time we look at these supernova remnants, they are already 100 to 1,000 years old. So we don't know how this transition goes from a supernova to a supernova remnant. So I'd like to urge you to just think about these cons. And uh, as, as we move on to the next slide, uh, uh, next couple of slides, we'll see why supernova, remnant, uh, supernova 1987A is an exception to all these cons. So I would now move on to, what I, uh, to talking about uh, one of the favorite supernovae of uh, most astronomers. And because this is where the birth of a supernova remnant can be very well studied. So 87A was a core collapse supernova discovered on 23rd of February, 1987 in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And it is the nearest and hence apparently brightest supernova observed in the last 400 years or since the invention of modern day telescope. So it's at a distance of 51 kiloparsec and it's in the LMC, which is uh, like a satellite galaxy to our own Milky Way. And 51 kiloparsec roughly translates to about 168,000 light years. So if, if someone were to observe uh, Earth from, from uh, the location of 87A, uh, will be 168,000 years in the past. So because of its proximity in astronomy, in astronomical terms, 51 kiloparsec, even though it sounds huge, is quite close by. And the, the remnant can be detected and, and resolved even like more than 30 years since the explosion. Now it's 2021 and it can still be seen and uh, monitored continuously across a wide band of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, early iconic Hubble images uh, showed the famous triple ring-like structure. So Hubble after its optics were uh, uh, modified and uh, we got beautiful images of 87A. And weirdly, it had three, uh, it had this triple ring structure, which is a central ring called as the equatorial ring. The size of this ring is about 1.6 arc seconds. And uh, the, these rings uh, uh, existed. The, the, the important point here is that these rings existed before the explosion, but we couldn't see them because the uh, because the the radiation from those rings were so weak that we couldn't detect it in any wavelength and we did not know that such interesting structures existed around that progenitor star before it exploded but after its explosion as the uh, photoionization reached all of these rings they were illuminated and we could see them in the hubble space telescope so 87a is a unique astrophysical laboratory to study the birth and early development of supernova remnant so as I said in the cons, uh, we know the distance, uh, we know where it has occurred, we know the uh, ambient medium, and we also know that this is quite young, which means that it, it almost ticks off all the cons and it converts them into pros. So 87A is special. As I said, it's, a progenit its progenitor is known because we have studied LMC so well that we know, we know a lot of stars in the LMC catalog and uh, the, uh, 
progenitor for 87A was a blue supergiant instead of the usual red supergiant. So when I explained what supernovae are, I only talked about red supergiant, but a less massive face is a blue supergiant. And this was a very uh, unique or unusual case where we did not think that blue supergiant is massive enough for, for a core collapse, but it turns out it is. And that's why it's, it's such a unique case. So this might be a very, uh, special case that's not how the uh, how things work in the universe but that is the only it is the only example we have as of now so so that's why it's special we know the distance we know the location and also these were the first sources of extrasolar neutrinos so the first neutrinos that were detected which were not from the sun was from supernova 1987a and that happened about 3 hours after the uh, after the supernova which very well uh, validated our theories about how neutron stars are formed. So this was awarded the Physics Nobel Prize in 2002. Uh, we also know the current age. And because we have continuous monitoring of this uh, supernova remnant, because it's possible, we, we do also know the environment really well. So to explain the uh, explain some of the physical uh, physical uh, to explain the physical picture that we know about 87A, we can consider different phases. So phase zero is the uh, is t equals zero when the explosion has not yet happened and we have a progenitor. So uh, what we have here is a side view of the equatorial ring. So we have three ring structures, a central ring and two rings in the outside. And uh, this is a ring that's created through a hydrodynamic simulation for visualization. And we are looking at a side view, a side view from the side uh, uh, of this equatorial ring. So this part, represents the equatorial ring with uh, several clumps of circumstellar matter. And uh, the, the star has not yet exploded yet. And we, we also know these distances and densities based on early optical observations. So phase one is t equals zero to 400 days. So this is when the photoionization from the supernova flash uh, illuminated the three rings. So imagine you are working at the at the telescope facility and this is what you see on 22nd of february and this is what you see on the 23rd of february uh, it would be an amazing sight to see that at the exact same point uh, the star no longer exists but what exists is a supernova explosion which sort of outshines everything else nearby in fact it outshines lmc as a whole so this is before the supernova and this is after the supernova explosion so it lights up all the narrow line uh, in in the narrow line optical and uv wave bands now we move on to phase two which is uh, from t equals 400 to 1200 seconds so the blast wave from the supernova is now freely expanding for the next 800 days it's traveling at velocities extremely high velocities of about like 30 thousand kilometers per second and the ejecta which is from the interior of the progenitor uh, uh, and the debris cloud is now expanding as well and uh, the light curve continues to decline because the uh, light curve is just the flux as a function of time as i explained uh, before and 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 this continues to decline right now because the blast wave is only heating up matter of extremely low density uh, which is not enough for any kind of detections in uh, different electromagnetic wa uh, wave bands so this is the free expansion phase uh, phase three uh, is from roughly 1200 to 3000 days since the supernova explosion and now we have the highly supersonic blast wave entering the interstellar matter and this is uh, the prototypical example of uh, 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 of how a supernova remnant uh, how the birth of a supernova remnant uh, uh, looks like because now we form the double canonical shock structure we have a forward shock we have a reverse shock and we have the contact discontinuity and uh, because now the the blast wave is heating up matter which is more dense than before the flux that we observe in different wave bands also increase and the inner ejector cloud is also uh, increasing in size from before phase 4 uh, is from 3000 till 5700 days so when these uh, uh, when this uh, blast wave reaches the inner edges of the equatorial ring which is the central ring what we found was that we started seeing these hotspots or these beads on a necklace. And we started seeing them in both the optical wave band and the X-ray wave band. 
And our best understanding is that these uh, circumstellar uh, rings have fingers or protrusions that pro protrude inside. And what we see as these spots are, are, these, uh, are, are these fingers being lit up by the blast wave. And uh, it could also be the case that the uh, that the that these fingers might be uh, symmetrical. We think that these fingers are not symmetrical, and that's why we have more more hotspots on the left side. Which in astro in astronomy, the uh, convention is that the left side is the east, and the uh, right side is the west. So on the eastern half, we have more. Uh, hotspots than the western half at 5,100 days. And we, we, we attribute it to having um, either uh, asymmetric finger size or the explosion itself was asymmetric. So after 5,700 days, which is now the case, uh, we have the main, uh, we have the blast wave moving into the main body of the equatorial ring, and the the flux has just uh, skyrocketed because now it's heating up matter which is like hundred times more uh, dense than before. So you can see that the ring now seems complete. You have different uh, bright spots all around the ring, and we also have these bright spots in X-rays. But uh, Chandra has a lower resolution than Hubble, so that's why we. Uh, we do not see we, we do not see the uh, spatial separation of these uh, uh, of these hotspots uh, better. Uh, uh, that's why we see the spatial separation of these hotspots better in uh, in the optical wavelengths. So, however, uh, since roughly after ten thousand days, what we have started to observe is that the blast wave is now possibly moving out of the equatorial ring. So uh, we had it uh, it approaching the equatorial ring. Then phase five was when it was inside the equatorial ring. And we think that roughly after 10,000 days, uh, in phase six, the, the blast wave has started to move out of the equatorial ring, now heating up the uh, unshocked ambient uh, CSM or ISM. And this is important because now, as, as the blast wave moves farther and farther outside, we are essentially going into the, uh, we are going farther and farther into the past of the progenitor star. So to just explain whatever I said in words, uh, we also have a, a, a video of the hydrodynamic uh, simulation of supernova 1987A. So we have the uh, equatorial ring even before the explosion. The explosion happens in 1987. The blast wave starts moving out from the center towards the equatorial ring. It starts heating the equatorial ring. And you see these high latitude emissions that come out from outside the equatorial ring. So these uh, these simulations have been exp extended farther onto uh, several years uh, into the future. And we start seeing the reverse shock moving towards the, inner, uh, towards the center and the blast wave moving outside. So it's in uh, very good agreement with, uh, with theoretical results. So we study the evolution of 87A, but why X-rays? So X-rays are incredibly useful because they directly trace the shock ejector and CSM properties. And they also tell us about the kinematics and energetics. So the two main ways we can analyze the uh, analyze X-rays from 87A are through spectroscopy and imaging. Now, all these prime nucleosynthesis pro uh, products that I showed in the onion-like structure are, on uh, are oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium. And also iron group elements like iron and nickel have extremely uh, prominent emission lines in the energy range where Chandra has Chandra X-ray Observatory has, uh, has a very good spectral resolution. And uh, also X-ray imaging, because it provides a direct way to map between the spatial distribution of these chemical elements that the uh, supernova produces uh, can be very well mapped through imaging. And uh, among all the uh, X-ray telescopes, Chandra X-ray Observatory has the best spatial resolution. So to do spectroscopic and imaging analysis, uh, for, for the best combination, uh, we use NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. And this is essential to study the vital physics of the evolution of the elusive supernova remnant 1987A. So just to give you a basic uh, overview of what Chandra X-ray Observatory is, it is, one of, it is the third of the NASA's great observatories. It was launched uh, on July 23, 1999. And uh, uh, it was deployed to high Earth orbit by Columbia. And 2019 marked 20 years of its exploration. 
It orbits Earth every 64 hours, ranging as far as 140,000 kilometers, which is about one third the way to the moon. And it detects astronomical X-rays by focusing them onto detectors by means of nested grazing incidence mirrors, because we cannot use uh, regular mirrors for uh, X-ray telescopes because X-ray photons have much higher energies than visible photons, and they'll get absorbed if you just put a normal mirror. Uh, also, Chandra's resolving power is about 10 times greater than any existing X-ray telescope. So this is equivalent to have the ability to read a stop sign at a distance of 12 miles. So this is a, a bit of a technical slide. But what I want you to take away from this is that from our observations, our data products are an image of 87A, the zeroth order spectrum of 87A, and the dispersed spectrum of 87A, which are the plus minus one orders. And we get this dispersed spectrum because of uh, transmission grating in the detector assembly. So we can do spectral analysis with the zeroth order spectra. We can do the spectral analysis with the first order spectra. And we can also do the imaging analysis with the image of 87A. So X-ray astronomy considers radiation at energies greater than 50, uh, 50 uh, EV. So in, in such a case, the primary data set is an events list. So we can measure, uh, we can see uh, a list of individually measured photons. So Chandra measures the spatial position of the X-ray photon that arrived on the detector, which constitutes into an image, the time of arrival, which constitutes into the timing analysis, and the photon energy, which constitutes the spectral analysis. So our main aims with the spectroscopic study is to see how these photon energies are distributed, or basically how these photon energy changes over time. So the basic... Uh, uh, method of doing spectral analysis is we load the spectra and detector response because every detector has its own response. So you have to convolute the spectra with the detector. We select the energy and wavelength range where we want to do our analysis. We choose and create models based on physics of the source. So here the source is supernova 87A. So we know what phase is it, phase it is in right now. And we try to create models based on that. We change the model parameters and try to fit the data. We examine where, how good a fit it is, if, uh, how, uh, if the residuals make sense, or if it has astrophysical meaning. So if it is good, our solution, if, if, if all of these are good, then we are done. If not, we go back and we change the model parameters and try to fit the data again. So now I would just like to show you some uh, results from uh, our own work. So uh, th these are not, uh, these might be uh, not, completely obvious, but I just wanted to show what kind of results we can obtain from Chandra data. So as I said, uh, from one of the main goals of the spectroscopic analysis is to measure the photon energy as a function of time. So photon energy as a function of time, uh, the, the, the y-axis is the X-ray flux, which is the photon energy, and the, and the uh, x-axis is the uh, age of the supernova. So uh, here I have here we have the X-ray flux plotted and uh, overlaid with the hydrodynamic model that I showed before, and also a magnetohydrodynamic model which has the magnetic fields in uh, incorporated. So till about age 27 or 25, the models and data were in complete agreement, and uh, that is that, that that is extremely encouraging for our uh, uh, for our understanding of 87A physics. But uh, since the last few years, we have started to see that the uh, data is almost a perfect average between the hydrodynamic model and the magnetohydrodynamic model, which means that our data can provide, uh, or our observations can provide very good uh, observational constraints for our model to make these uh, models fit our data better in the later evolution stage of 87A. Uh, with, uh, so the other, the other, uh, branch of analysis is the imaging analysis. So we can actually monitor the changing morphology of the X-ray remnant because uh, it can be resolved by Chandra and we can see what the overall expansion rate uh, is and we can try to search for the elusive compact object at the center. So as I said, when you have a, a core collapse supernova, a, a neutron star should be formed, but we haven't seen that in 87A yet. So as you can see that the uh, the image the 87A images change on time scales of months, which might not seem like much, but all the other supernova remnants that we have, they do not change over centuries. So over centuries, they, their images look exactly the same. But in case of 87A, you can see that 
from 2000 till 2020, the image has changed drastically. We, were, we have had a reversal of uh, asymmetry. We have the eastern side was brighter before. Now the western side is brighter, and then it got dimmer again. So in the recent years, we have indications of the shock leaving the inner ring. So as the shock moves out of the uh, equatorial ring, it starts uh, the equatorial ring starts to dim down. So this is a montage of the uh, of all the wavelengths uh, of uh, Hubble and Chandra overlaid with one another, and you can see that the central uh, ejecta and dust is also expanding, and the blast wave is also expanding outward. And this this sort of perfectly uh, summarizes the physical picture that we uh, understand of 87A, uh, because these uh, images are also getting uh, brighter and larger. We can measure their radius and measure how fast they are expanding, and uh, we can plot the radius expansion as a function of the age. And this perfectly aligns with the point where the blast wave starts moving into the dense equatorial ring. So when, before, it was moving much faster. And as it starts to move into the uh, dense ring, it has much more of a resistance. And the speed slows down. And uh, we all, all of these speeds are uh, linear. That is what we find from our uh, fits. And this is the image from uh, September 2019 that I showed before. So just to quickly uh, show the final result from our paper, uh, it is that uh, we can also plot the volume emission measure, which is defined as the density, which is a proxy for the density of the electrons being shocked. So if we, if we assume certain geometries and uh, a density profile, what we find is that the density profile of recent years observations matches with that of the standard red supergiant wind beyond the inner ring. So this gives more strength to our idea that 87E progenitor used to be a red supergiant, uh, a red supergiant, then it got converted into a blue supergiant, and there were some oscillations between those two phases, and finally it exploded as a blue supergiant. So this, uh, the, the density structure that we see post-2011 is an indication that since 2011, the the uh, which was like the uh, day 9000 uh, or 8500, the blast wave has started to move out of the equatorial ring. Uh, as I said, we have not found any central neutron star yet in the last 30 years. Uh, detection of neutrino bursts means that uh, a neutron star was formed. And the reason why we haven't seen these neutron stars is probably because the absorption column near the center is is so dense that the X-ray observations can't be clearly uh, observed. One of our major goals is to look at look for any such signatures that show up in our future spectra or images. However, recently there was some high angular resolution images from millimeter survey, which is in the radio band, uh, that indicated an indirect detection of the existence of a neutron star because this part of the dust was apparently a bit hotter but we do not have yet a direct detection of the neutron star. So just to summarize, uh, supernovae are some of the most highly energetic processes in the known universe, creating astrophysical laboratories that are far beyond our human abilities. And supernova remnants are the key to understanding distribution of metals into the nearby interstellar media, which eventually make uh, everything around us and it is sort of a real life persistence of memory, if you may. And uh, the X-ray remnant of supernova 1987A is a unique opportunity to study these early developmental stages of a supernova remnant, uh, the nature of its progenitor and the explosion physics. So uh, no talk about supernovae or stars is complete without a quote by Carl Stegen. So the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. And uh, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, I would be glad to uh, take them. And if you have, if you want to ask these questions later on, that's also fine. This is my email ID and that's my uh, Twitter handle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Uh, that's an interesting talk indeed. Uh, we have a few pro uh, questions from the audience. So we'll ask them one by one. So the first question is by uh, Nawala. Uh, and it asks, like, what happened if one star of the binary 
system collapse into supernova but the outer is still burning uh, could you repeat that question once more yeah so uh, it asks like what happens if one star of the binary system collapses into mm -hmm. a supernova but the other star is still burning okay uh, so that's exactly what happens when you have uh, When you have the single degenerate case, you have one star that is still burning, which is in the red super giant, uh, which is in the red giant phase, and the other one goes supernova. So uh, the leading theory is that okay, as ob observationally we have never detected this companion star. So what we what we tend to believe is that the companion star is destroyed by the by the supernova explosion. However, uh, we are not one hundred percent sure. If we ever detect some, uh, if uh, it could be, it could be that the uh, companion star is pushed away, and it is now an independent star or uh, evolving on its own, and it has been kicked out of the binary system. But as of now, uh, we think that the companion star is destroyed. So, if one of the stars in the binary system is still burning, it's most probably destroyed by the supernova. Uh, I hope that answers the prop, uh, question. Uh, the next, uh, the next problem is uh, neutrinos are weakly interacting particles. So how do they create enough force to drive such powerful explosions? Okay, uh, neutrinos are weakly interacting particles, but they uh, they have extremely high energy, and and this energy uh, drives other processes that push on the in falling layers of stars so it's not exactly neutrinos that are pushing the layers but it's the the indirect effects of the neutrinos because so many neutrinos are moving at such high velocities they they heat up the ambient medium which causes the core to bounce all these in in uh, uh, in falling layers now the exact microphysics of how the blast wave is uh, pushed out or how the uh, how the implosion converts into an explosion is not known because we do not have the technology or the uh, resolution to to observe these uh, microsecond uh, physical processes in great detail but our best understanding is that neutrinos indirectly cause the ambient medium to push the infalling layers of the uh, of the massive star so yes, neutrinos interact weakly, and that is exactly the reason why we can detect neutrinos from core collapse supernovae. Uh, okay, uh, the next question is by uh, Fadil Karim. He asks, like, uh, he or she asks, what is a satellite galaxy? Okay. So just like uh, our moon orbits the Earth because it's uh, sort of uh, tidally attached to the Earth, uh, or, or, or it's trapped in Earth's gravity. Uh, it's the same case for uh, galaxies, where uh, LMC is a satellite galaxy which orbits around our own galaxy, Milky Way. So we have the LMC, which is the Large Magellanic Cloud, and the SMC, which is the Small Magellanic Cloud. Both of them uh, move around our galaxies. Unfortunately, we can't see them in the Northern Hemisphere, so we'll have to go to the Southern Hemisphere to see that see them in the night sky. Uh, okay. Uh, the next question is by Arun Ayer. He said, uh, I read an internet about some binary star explosion that is going to happen in 2022. Can you briefly uh, give your comments on that? Uh, I, I I don't know where. So, so the thing is that predicting a supernova explosion is like pre predicting an earthquake, but maybe even more uh, ridiculous because we, we don't just don't know. Uh, when these stars explode. And as I said, uh, in case of uh, the best known red supergiant that we have now is the uh, is Betelgeuse in the Orion constellation. And the error bars, if, if you ask an astronomer when Betelgeuse is exploding, the error bars that they give is plus minus 1 million years. So my comments is that uh, if you ask me if it's going to explode in 2022, my answer is 2022 plus minus 1 million years. So plus 1 million years, basically. So in the next 1 million years, it might explode. OK. Uh, so uh, I don't see any further questions.
yeah thank you and uh, if you have any any more further questions about uh, anything in uh, also related to graduate school you can um, send shoot me an email or uh, catch me on twitter uh so we don't see any further questions from the audience so that's an interesting talk indeed and it's a very it's our honor to have you and 